and we have to really escalate the noise we make so that we'll be heard. Welcome to Gay USA. I'm Andy Hum. I'm Ann Northrup. And this is our special Thanksgiving Day show, whenever you are seeing it, because we're thankful to have Blanche Wiesencook as our uh, guest for the entire hour tonight. And we're, we're just thrilled. Now, for those of you who don't know, Blanche is a distinguished professor of history at John Jay College and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. She's also been herself a progressive activist since the 1950s. And she's a noted biographer of uh, Dwight Eisenhower. But uh, she is also the author of this book, and that's why we're here to talk today. We, there's a picture of the book. Eleanor Roosevelt, The War Years, 1939 to 1962. It's the third volume on Eleanor Roosevelt that she's written. The first two volumes were New York Times bestsellers, and we expect this one to be too, if it's not already. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> well, give it time. Yes, exactly. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the midst of the madness America is now experiencing, uh, being able to spend more time with this book, I have to say, has been a refuge. Uh, being able to go back to this and read about this great champion of human rights uh, who coped with a world war and deep, a deeply racist society and securing human rights throughout the world in the aftermath in the war. And there really is, and I, I mean this, uh, a revelation on every single page of this book. So here we are. Let's get started. It's also eerie reading this book because of the echoes back and forth between her time and ours. Uh, but can we, and Blanche, we adore you, and we're really happy to have you yeah. here. Well, Andy. And I love you. As you know, this is such a thrill. And Gay USA forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. But, I mean, uh, you know, you have been such an important uh, peace activist, feminist activist, uh, lesbian activist, uh, anti-racism uh, activist across the board. And, and it's all in this book, too. And I, I'd like to start just because our audience has a wide range of ages, and it has been a while since Eleanor at this point. Uh, I'd ask you to situate her in history as uh, Andy yells at me when I refer to her as a first lady because she so transcends that. But her transcending of that is unique, I think. And uh, when I look at the rest of the women who have uh, occupied that position, I think, my God, this is just a different universe. And put that picture up of her and Franklin because she was, uh, uh, she was married to Franklin Roosevelt, the president of the United States. <laughs> right, she was. Indeed, she was. Yeah. And she is the niece of oh, Theodore you. Roosevelt. Yes. And um, there's a new book called The Hissing Cousins, which deals with the rivalry <laughs> between Eleanor, T.R.'s favorite child, and his daughter, Edith, who really can't stand Eleanor Roosevelt. <laughs> and it's a very interesting story. She was married to the Republican Speaker of the House, wasn't yes, she? Yes, yes. Alice. Alice Roosevelt Longworth. Yes. And they got divorced. Anyway, it's a very interesting rivalry because Eleanor Roosevelt really does become this great progressive. Yeah. And um, it's an amazing story. And it really starts in volume one where I talk about her childhood of loss and misery. Both her and parents died when she was very young. Very her young. Hus her father was a bad alcoholic, which right. made her very distrustful of uh, drinking, drinking or potential. But it's also her commitment to people in want, in need, in trouble. Yes. She goes around the country and around the world, tell me, what can what can I do for you? What and that do you was early want? on. That early was, on, from yeah. the very beginning. What do you want? What do you need? The, she wants to make things better for everybody in want and need. People just like her own family. I mean, mm -hmm. how much do you have to drink to die at the age of 34? <laughs> which her father did. Which her father did. A lot. So her mother turns her face to the wall. Eleanor is eight. Her father dies. She loves him. She's 10. Yeah. And she is this orphan. Um, protected a bit by her grandmother and aunts, but not very much. 
Um, and then she goes off to school in England where she is encouraged by the headmistress, Marie Sylvestre, who sees her, who appreciates her brilliance and her power, and um, who encourages her to think for herself, to be bold, and to do sports and music. And Eleanor Roosevelt, at the age of 76, says the happiest day of her life is the day she made the first team at field hockey. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've always pushed that. Right. But but I really want to have you explain the difference between Eleanor in her position as first lady or before or after and and what I see is the ineffectual uh, uh, role of first lady. Yes. Yeah. Well, she's the first one who takes to her pen to criticize her husband and she has her own daily column, My Day, from 1936 until her death. She's also known as the First Lady of Radio. She writes dozens of articles a month, and she writes about 20 books. I mean, And these, okay. were, these were not books about how to bake cookies. <laughs> no, no. She really is a political activist. And her mantra, her theme, is that governments exist for only one purpose to make life better for all people. And in the beginning, when FDR has polio and his mother encourages him to just become, you know, a, a member of the gentry, a gentleman farmer, you don't have to work anymore, and Eleanor says, no, no, you'll be very bored, you love politics, <laughs> and really encourages him to re-enter politics, and she in this magnificent man, Louis Howe, who disappears after volume one, but whose impact on her is very real. Um, and so he says to Eleanor Roosevelt, you be his eyes and his ears. He can't travel. He can't meet people. And FDR trusts that. That's part of their deal. That's mm -hmm. part of their arrangement. You can, he says to his friends, anybody will tell anything to my wife. And he really trusts that she is not only his eyes and his ears, but, as all of his friends say, his conscience. And that's their um, arrangement. And he doesn't silence her, even when he doesn't want to support the things that she fights for. He, he says, build a democratic movement, make me do it. I mean, because he, too, is a Democrat. And she believes to the very end, even though they disagree about the most profound things during the war, race and rescue, that basically he is with her, but he has to juggle this hideous Congress of what we now call Dixiecrats. And we see how hideous this Congress can be in our own lifetime, having just witnessed it with President Obama. People forget that the Democrats were the racist party forever, uh, the right. Southern Democrats especially, but Northern Democrats as well. Uh, the Republican Party is the one party of Lincoln got rid of slavery, for, you know, fought right. the Democrats. And the party of Eisenhower. Yes. Eisenhower was a liberal Republican, and people forget how truly segregated the U.S. was. In World War II, it's about integrating the military. The military doesn't get integrated until Eisenhower's presidency. Truman says it should be integrated, but it doesn't happen until Eisenhower goes around to every base and fires every bird colonel who doesn't want to integrate the military, right. his base. The other thing, blood plasma is segregated. People don't know this. Mm -hmm. Blood plasma is segregated, black and white, Christian and Hebrew. <laughs> until 1958. And Eisenhower, by executive order, says, we're going to integrate blood plasma. <coughs> the head of the Red Cross, a guy named General Al Grunther, who's his buddy from the military, you know, calls him and says, I, you can't do that. The South doesn't want integrated blood. 1958, Ike says, then they won't get any blood. But let's go back to the war. Eleanor Roosevelt helps with uh, not the integration of the military because they didn't allow that during the war. Right. Um, but uh, uh, black uh, soldiers and sailors were only basically allowed to be cooks and people to clean up. Uh, and she, she advocates that. for the Tuskegee Airmen. Right. Uh, pilots. The, pilots, uh, to let them fly, and they do organize them, and yet they're not flying. So she, we have a picture of this. She, she goes up on the plane with them. Absolutely. And... 
and How changes was that received? the story. Well, in the white press, it's received with horror. In the black press, it's received with jubilation. But it begins to change military opinion and public opinion. It begins to change. And the Tuskegee Airmen are one of the most you know, prominently heroic folks during World War II, they are bemetaled and they are, you know, there's a whole list in my book um, of what great things they, they really did. She was an amazing activist on uh, racial issues long before what we think of as the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s. Right. Uh, it, it was somewhat of a revelation to me to read how deeply she was involved, how committed she was, and how outspoken she was. Right. And it starts in 1934, as early as that, when the educators of America meet and pass a resolution unanimously saying segregation should be abolished. It does terrible things to everybody. It encourages black children to think they are inferior, white children to assume they are superior, and it destroys all hope for community. Whereupon, and this is May 1934, and everybody should read the whole speech in volume two, Eleanor Roosevelt strides upon the stage and says, how stupid we have been to limit the education of any of our children. We must educate all our children and recognize that we will all go ahead together or we will all go down together. I love it when you imitate Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> this is you're, you're missing your performing career. I, I missed it, yes. I really am a and, thespian. And she, <laughs> and she was a life member of the NAACP. And look, we're going to cover a lot of topics, but as long as we're on race, uh, she's also the one who quit the Daughters of the American Revolution. Right. To oh, talk about back. that and Marian Anderson. Right. I mean, here is this great of. global diva who is the hero of the opera. And Marian Anderson. Marian Anderson. There she is. On the right there and with Eleanor. She is to sing at Constitution Hall, owned by, or not even owned by, but presided over by the daughters of the American Revolution who say, no, no, she can't sing. Horrifying everybody in Washington, not everybody, but the progressives and the Democrats, the big, D, small D Democrats. And Harold Ickes and Eleanor Roosevelt say, well, she should sing at the Lincoln Memorial. And so on Easter Sunday, and Eleanor Roosevelt quits the DAR. And a lot of people don't speak to her after she does that. People who had been friends with her, they're horrified that she has quit the DAR over this racial event. And Marian Anderson sings at the Lincoln Memorial, and over 75,000 people are there enraptured. And it's broadcast all over the country and all over the world. And it is really one of those. Um, it was a fundamental turning point, it really I think, is a in, point. in public opinion. It, absolutely. But at the same time. She got a lot of praise, for, I mean, in the press for it. She, but she was also accused of being a communist for her uh, support of African American people and and a integrated society. And I mean, we'll go through back and forth with this. But I am struck by uh, we are today as we sit here recording, uh, talking about the nomination coming of Jeff Sessions as Attorney General of the United States in 2016, a man who has said that civil rights organizations like uh, the NAACP are communist. Right. That any, any work on racial issues is by communists. He's Absolutely. never been to an NAACP convention. It's like going to church. Right. <laughs> it is like going to church. Moreover, every civil rights leader in the U.S. in the 40s and 50s was branded a communist. And so John Edgar Hoover, or J. Edgar Comey, whatever, I mean, here they are, <laughs> hounding the civil rights movement. So you have people like Virginia Durr, Ann Braden, these great white heroes for civil rights in Alabama and Georgia. And they're, they're all attacked, not just by the Klan. They are attacked by the Klan, and, you know, crosses mm -hmm. are burned on their property, but they are followed, they're 
phones are tapped, they are called communists, and Eleanor Roosevelt is called a communist by J. Edgar Hoover. Her phones are tapped, her beds are bugged in hotel rooms, and, you know, it really is, to, and 80 percent, or maybe 90 percent, of her huge FBI file that goes on for over 4,000 pages is anything she says against lynching, anything she says against segregation or racial violence. And J. Edgar Hoover, in his sidebars along the reports, calls her that old cow meeting with her commie friends again, that old hen. I mean, it's disgusting. People have to remember that it was impossible in this period to pass an anti-lynching bill, right. and she could not even get Franklin to come out for it because right. he depended on the Southern Democrats. For the what did an anti-lynching bill say that was so controversial? It just said lynching is murder. Oh, wow. Because yeah. there were laws, and there still isn't there There's still something laws. about uh, you can, uh, uh, you know, for some crimes you can still kill people in ways that are otherwise. I, you know, I don't know. Uh, some but, of those crazy laws. But the echoes of that with uh, uh, certainly the attacks on Hillary Clinton. Now we're not Hillary's greatest fans, and we think she's not been as bold as Eleanor. I voted for her. Uh, yeah, well, I did too. <laughs> we all voted, we for, all her. voted for her, but right. uh, we would have liked her to be el more, more Eleanorian. Eleanorian. <laughs> yes. 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 And she said well, Eleanor, she used to speak to Eleanor yes. when she was in the I White think, House. I, you mean, know, she, I think she misjudged. You know, Ele if Eleanor really, you know, spoke to her more clearly at this election, <laughs> she said, remember I said. <laughs> We <laughs> must have jobs for everybody. Yes. So I think that would be a very big issue. Jobs for everybody. The other thing is Eleanor Roosevelt, before Bernie Sanders, in 1943, Eleanor Roosevelt called for free public education, excellent public education, K through college. College has to be free and available for all American young people. And it was in the city of New York. And it was. The city, up until that's the right, 70s. Up until the 70s. And with where open enrollment, teach. where I teach, with open enrollment and the SEEK program, the tuition started to rise. And so uh, you have great leaders like Julius C.C. C. Edelstein, who gave us open enrollment and the SEEK program and, and fought to preserve free tuition. He lost. And, you know, well, I went to the University of Virginia. It was only $700 a semester, and I was out of state. And that now is an enormously expensive school right. for out of state and for in-state students. Yeah. But we've, we've and abandoned they're closing, that. Yeah, they're closing public colleges all over the country, including the great school of journalism at UCLA, which closed last year. And abandoning public education yeah. for... And ending sports and music programs. Yes, yes. I mean, who would want to go to school? without sports and music. You know, I mean, I was first violinist in Mr. Stone's Children's Orchestra. I got my violin to take home. I didn't and, have to buy it. And a gymnast. And a gymnast, yes, I was. <laughs> my life is an accident. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it, 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 well, uh, do you want to delve into why we're such a stupid country and uh, why well, we have this great well, divide? And uh, I, I think we've lost the democracy. I think that we really have to look at stolen elections, mm -hmm. at redistricting, at gerrymandering, at the end of the Voter Rights Act, sure. at the fact that in in communities like Madison, Wisconsin, three hundred thousand people, young people, students, and old people, Democrats, were turned away from the polls. So, so we're looking at a stolen election, and we're looking at... What can we do about that? Well, well I nonetheless, think we tens need to of millions, Tens of millions of people have voted for this fascist uh, uh, government that is now taking power. And it, I find that more confounding. more people voted, at least two to six million yes. more voted... Absolutely. For... Hillary and the others. It's very scary. It's very scary. And I think that we really, part of it is the media, the mainstream network media, which has lost its 
which has really lost everything. Whatever happened to equal time for equal candidates? Oh, that's candidates? no longer a law. But 30 yeah. years, up till 30 years ago, the that networks had to do equal time. Well, they they were loss leaders, the news divisions. They The networks were proud of doing uh, comprehensive news. There were... Public service. The networks documentaries. did documentaries in right. prime time. And then in the 80s, those, the Reagan Revolution. The networks were bought by bigger corporations. They used to be independent, and the corporations came in and said, "Why, there's a profit center we've been missing. It's the news division," and that is literally how it changed. Ken Oletta wrote a book about it. It's and uh, cable television isn't bound by any uh, strictures no of fairness at all. At all. Yeah. And so you have Fox yeah. News, but even on CNN and all these other places, the they're not doing good job. No of informing people and balancing things. Well, I think Look that's at that stupid really Leslie Stahl interview with the Trumps. She didn't ask us any good questions no. or, or penetrate him at all. Really scary. Yeah. So I think, you, you know, what's happened, the dumbing down of America, it's not an accident that we have closed public schools all over the country. It's not an accident that fewer and fewer people are going to colleges. It's not an accident. I think we're really looking at the origins of a fascist putsch and we've lived through it, not quite seeing it, and now we see it. And so now we have to regroup and take it all back and fight for it again. Block Revolution. by block, precinct and Eleanor, by precinct. Eleanor Roosevelt said, it's about the movement. You cannot trust politicians <laughs> to do You have to build a movement, door to door, right. block by block, community by community, to make our wants and our needs known and heard she called it trooping for democracy, and that's what we have right. to do. People who are waiting for Chuck Schumer to take a lead and start calling the government out for what it is now are not going to be happy. No, but there is Elizabeth Warren, and there is Bernie Sanders, and there is a movement. There is a whole new movement, and maybe when Clinton recovers from her depression, which is inevitable, she will recover, she can join the movement, and her voice But it needs might to be, be younger. Good. It needs to be younger. I mean, even Elizabeth Warren is in her mid to late sixties. But she's good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, but, we, and, we but really she has need, young people around. Yes, her. that's and that's and what there we are need. young people all around. And, and Eleanor I was very involved. She with was youth. the youth movement. Yeah, you really encourage the youth movement, and that's our job as educators and media folks. I mean, you are encouraging the young people. I'm encouraged, you know, and they encourage me. They teach me more than I teach them. Talk They're about your great. students. You teach at John Jay. You teach at the Graduate Center at CUNY, I do. too. Yes. Uh, talk yeah. about your students and who they are and what they say, particularly in the wake of this election. Well, my students, a lot of them didn't want to vote at all after Bernie. They were all for Bernie, and then they didn't want to vote. They said it didn't matter, and I encouraged them that it did matter. Um, and I, but, but given that they were in my class and they went to vote, what about all the other students? And that's really the crisis that we're in. A lot of folks were just completely, I mean, less than half of the electorate voted. Yes. This is, this is very scary. And so we need to reconsider what a democratic movement is. And it has to be changed. And that's what Elizabeth Warren and Bernie and the movement is in the process of, of doing. So we, some, need, we need new leadership, we need new vision. See anybody on think, the horizon besides people you've mentioned? Well, I think we don't know who's going to be on the horizon because it's going to be another generation we haven't met yet. But I think they're out there, like Black Lives Matter. They yeah. are out there. Yeah. And I think there's a whole very vigorous, you know, outright, you know, the, uh, which used to be um, Eagle Herc, but is now yes. outright. Yes. The global gay rights movement is yes. very powerful. There's a movement called Nesri.org to get the economic and social rights initiative, the covenant, um, taken seriously. A group of young people who are really great activists. Well, so I feel very encouraged. Well, uh, maybe because you are teaching and do have daily contact, I'm and, of and course impressed. Also, a lot of my students at John Jay are veterans. And the Veterans for Peace are, I think, some of the most powerful voices we have. Um, I, I'm very moved by them. They know what they're talking about. They've been there. They are really organizing. 
Well, John and, Jay, in fact, is the John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and we think of it historically as, you know, the college that people went to to become police officers or whatever, and, and thought of it but stereotypically. But it was created to stop, it was created in the 60s because there was so much community violence. Uh -huh. And so we existed to what kind of community policing can there be so the violence would evaporate and we would have peace officers, not cops bashing so, your head. So tell us more about what they think and, and Well, we what teach for justice and, and our students are really, a lot of them are fabulous. Mm -hmm. Some of my students were there last night. Um, you know, they're people who are, they've gone to law school, um, they've done great work. They're doing great work. They, you know, the ACLU, the CCR, the Center for Constitutional Rights, these are organizations that encourage justice, U.S. justice, global justice. And I feel very hopeful about. Great. Can we go back to some of Eleanor's origins of how she got involved in all this? I mean, her, her marriage with Franklin was troubled. I mean, they were great partners to the end right. and uh, respected each other and loved each other. Uh, but in terms of what we traditionally think of as a marriage. And she surrounded herself with a lot of strong women. Right. Let's talk about some of those relationships. Uh, talk about Lorena Hickok, who we've uh, heard of. You were, you were one of the only biographers who really deals with the fact that they were, it had a romantic love with each other. Absolutely. Uh, even, when, even Ken Burns doesn't want to bring no, this out. He'll he bring out that Lorena's a lesbian, but not Eleanor. Right. Um, well, the origins, the origins of my book were um, a review I did on this really stupid book by Doris Faber, who was horrified by these love letters. She couldn't believe that these letters couldn't possibly mean what they seemed to mean. Between Lorena I, between, and Eleanor. I can't wait to lie down beside you mm -hmm. and take you in my arms. And so, you know, ultimately I wrote a very nasty review. These letters do mean, you know, a cigar may not always be a cigar. <laughs> Pache, Sigmund Freud. Mm -hmm. But the northeast corner of your mouth against my lips mm -hmm. is always the northeast <laughs> corner. And that was basically. Um, but, but I didn't start doing this because I'm, you know, a military historian. I was doing international relations. I just finished my Eisenhower book. And... I read this book because Kate Stimson had sent it to me, lonely and miserable in Abilene, where you couldn't eat a dry town, you couldn't even get wine with dinner. Um, so I made friends with the local sheriff and we shot guns and drank his single malt. Eisenhower's um, hometown. Eisenhower's hometown. And when I got back after doing this rev review, um, I called Joe Lash, who was my pal, he had blurred my book on Crystal Eastman, saying this is a book that should stay in print forever. Tell, I, explain who he is. Okay, Joe Lash was Eleanor Roosevelt's sort of chosen son, her bestie um, in the last years of her, you know, the later years of her life, <coughs> and her biographer, and a really wonderful writer and journalist. And um, so I called him up and I said, what's up with you not having Hick in any of your books at all. It doesn't mention her. And he said, I hated her. Um, let's have dinner. <laughs> so we had dinner, and he explained to me that he hated her because she was an anti Semite oh. and a bigot. And um, so Joe and his wife, Truda, who is this great German um, scholar, um, she graduated from the University of Freiburg in 1931, <clears throat> comes to the U.S., teaches at Hunter, graduated with a Ph.D., I should say, um, teaches at Hunter and goes back to Germany to run an anti-Nazi paper. Peter Pratt, who's fallen in love with her, Peter Pratt, Pratt Institute, Pratt Oil, follows her back to Berlin. They get married. Hitler, um, the Nazis destroy the newspaper office, kill her editors, destroy her home, come to power in January. They leave for the U.S. in February 33, and she has three children. Um, meets Joe Lash about 1940, and they fall in love. It's a very interesting relationship. And Eleanor Roosevelt, a little part of the book is Eleanor Roosevelt encouraging uh, Truda to get divorced. Real love matters. And that raises the question, 
um, always. Uh, maybe she was sorry she never got divorced, or maybe she just wanted, it's an unclear. Bottom line, um, Joe takes me up to Hyde Park, and I see that there really is a story to tell, because he's the good son. Anything Eleanor Roosevelt wanted him to deal with, he dealt with. She didn't want to deal with, he didn't. She said, I don't care about power. He wrote that. Then I knew I had a story. <laughs> and hence I decided, okay, I could do it. He encouraged me to and, do and a biography. And you were willing to write about Hick and others were Absolutely. not. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's not just... And I thought it was important to write about Hick, who's very important A journalist, to by the yes. way. <clears throat> who says to Eleanor Roosevelt, why are you sending me all these letters, these 10-page letters detailing your day? The whole country wants to know how you spend your day. And that's the origins of her column. Her column, My Day, My day which was published six days a week. Right. She was so energetic. Right. And then, and then there are the other women who were, uh, who were also lesbian, who were great influences on her. Um, Esther Lamp is my favorite. And Elizabeth Reed, and a Elizabeth couple. And Elizabeth Reed, a couple. Elizabeth Reed became her financial advisor. And Esther Lamp was a great scholar. And advocate for universal health care. Universal health care, what we now call single payer, yes. which was supposed to be in the 1935 Social Security Act. Nuts. But the AMA lobbied it to death. <laughs> <laughs> and now and a then, lot of doctors are in favor of it. Yeah, right. Well, we need single payer. Yeah. That's Every doctor the only, I go to wants single We're payer. the only country in the industrial world without it. It's yeah. crazy. So Eisenhower in 1957 who has fired Eleanor Roosevelt in 53. He doesn't want, you know, to be part of the UN human rights effort. But in 57, with the Health Reinsurance Act, he encourages Eleanor Roosevelt and Esther Lape to come back and help him get what he wants, which is like single payer, simple, just like in the military, everybody covered. Mm -hmm. And Ovita Kolpabi, who is also, um, a life member of the NAACP, and people don't know that. She'd been head of the wax. Um, you know, she agrees, but the AMA lobbies it, and it becomes right. just the Health Reinsurance Act, Medicaid, Medicare. And Esther Lape is given the pen by Eisenhower that he signed in front of a press conference, and she waves it, and she says, now this represents just a puny little bone <laughs> in the vertebrae, Good. what I, love I that. had so, in mind. But she's love hanging it. out with a lesbian couple yes. she's very close to. She's, and then she lives with a lesbian couple, Nancy Cook and Marion Dickerman. They have a falling out in volume two. Yeah. Um, and but was any of this known publicly at the time? No. Were any of these no. people living at all openly? Was there any They're, they're all living openly. There is, nobody notices it. Okay. Nobody yes, talks I, about I, it. They're, they're all, all invisible. Uh, invisible. Yeah. But she but They used the phrase new women for some of these women, yes? Well, was that a phrase in those days? They, they The 20s, new yeah. women. Uh -huh. But they're called she-men. <laughs> Some of Eleanor Roosevelt's <laughs> friends who go around in, you know, riding jodhpurs and so on, um, FDR's pals call them she-men. And even FDR calls them she-men Well, and I was going to ask what his uh, attitude was well, to... Well, his attitude is welcoming because he is having his, his own you know, stuff. serial um, w women yeah. in his life, um, including Lu um, this first Lucy Merson, that yeah. breaks... That almost breaks them up, because right. Eleanor Roosevelt feels really betrayed. But by the time Missy Lahand becomes the junior wife, Eleanor Roosevelt is merely grateful that he has someone to be with him all the time, because she does not want to be with him all the time. No, but she, and she seemed to have uh, uh, complicated relationships with other men, too. Would you describe her as bisexual, or...? Well, I, I describe her as a serial romantic. <clears throat> I don't know what her physical connection mm -hmm. to any of these people are. Um, in the case of Earl Miller, if you look at Earl Miller, I've created this, you know, this category, why not? <laughs> I mean, he's so... Mm, and, who was he, and who was he to hot. her? He is first her bodyguard. Right. And FDR assigns him to protect her. Mm -hmm. But he becomes immediately one of her best friends, and they shoot together. He, she doesn't want to be tailed by security. 
And he says, okay, then learn how to shoot. So he gets her a gun and they shoot together. And they, but they like to shoot, so they do targets. And then he buys her her horse, Dot, and they ride together, and they camp together, and they swim together, and they do all kinds of things together. And he also plays the piano like her father did, mm -hmm. and he sings. And he has a lot of showbiz friends, like Mayris Cheney, who is called Tiny. And so there's another, there's a whole other world that Eleanor inhabits with Earl Miller. And that the mystery of Earl Miller is that all their correspondence has disappeared. Uh -huh. There is no correspondence between them that has survived. Anybody out there knows no where it is? No hard drives hanging around. <laughs> to see it. But I mean, so she has all these different social circles. Not everybody gets along with no, each other no. all the time. There's tension. <laughs> There's, and she ignores it. But she also, uh, because because of all the pressure on her and things, she also has a lot of sadness and depression to some extent in her life. Wait. I mean, you talk about her her Griselda mood during the during the presidency, going off to Rock Creek Park Cemetery. We have a picture of this to this statue of grief that Henry Adams put up for his uh, for wife his who wife. committed suicide. But after and he she's had just, and she sits there for hours right. uh, before this statue. Uh, and she that's... brings and she brings all of her friends, all of her new friends, sit with her and contemplate grief, so they could under so she feels they will understand the origins of her moods. Um, and how she gets out of these Griselda moods is to do more and more work. The more work she does, the better she feels. But and we're all in a Griselda mood right now, right? <laughs> and need right. to get out of it. Absolutely. If we're going to turn so things around. So we have around. to march again, my darlings, is what <laughs> I've been saying. Will, will Melania be leading us uh, <laughs> to a new era? I <laughs> doubt it. <laughs> I don't I know. I think she's probably it. unhappy to be trapped in the White House. I think Well, they may not even move to the White House. That's it true. Looks they like may they're not. just going to take over. Stay in the Gold House. The, yeah. <laughs> my God. But it is, it seems... Uh, even with uh, the uh, progressive attitudes of Hillary and, and Michelle Obama in the first lady position, it, it seems to me unimaginable that someone could be as active and as political as Eleanor was these days. And I, I'm astonished that she could have done all that then and that we have lost all that now. Yeah. What was her trick? How did she get away with it? Because she was always being scrutinized. How did she, how did she make it happen in the context of her role as First Lady? Um, I think she just ignored opposition. She just ignored the terrible things that were written about her. You know, and she said, courage can be as contagious as fear. Yes. And when she was viciously attacked by various right-wing press people, she just ignored it. Um, and FDR encouraged her to ignore it. You don't want to get into a pissing match with those people, he said. And she didn't. She just ignored it. And he, unlike many of our current, even Obama, he would say about the opposition, I welcome their hatred. Yes, he did. You know, and they're the other side, and I'm fighting them. Right. And Obama, right. like, I'm conciliator, and it didn't yeah, work. It didn't work didn't work. I mean, FDR was right in 1940 when he said, we will have a liberal democracy.